Exodus 25. After Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And then just take note of what is being asked. The offering which ye shall take of them, gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skin, shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for uh, anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary. Now we're getting down to the purpose. We could, we could take this taxonomy and set it right there in the purpose. And God spells out the purpose right here, that I may dwell among them. We could analyze every single thing by this taxonomy. What was the purpose in building the tabernacle? That I may dwell among them. God being God, by the way, he could have... He could have dwelt among them in any capacity. I mean, think about it. The creator of the universe could have come in any dimension. He spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. He could have come and commune with them in any fashion. He's God. He's capable of doing anything, right? Uh, some of you are not sure. <laughs> we'll, come, we'll, we'll come back to the uncertain ones later. All right. So, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Do I hear any subjectivity as to, or ambiguity as to how this tabernacle should be made? The answer is? No. Okay, that was only about 25% of you. The answer is? No. Thank you. I'm feeling slightly better now, just to make sure we're all communing in the same place. So now, this is interesting. God begins to tell Moses beginning with the Ark of the Covenant. And why this is so striking to me as I was reading through this and trying to get to this last week, so we're, we've kind of done our review now, is God says to make an Ark of Shittim wood. And let me just say that wood, which is the same as the acacia or Shittim wood. One of the strangest things, you know, we always say this wood represents Christ's humanity. But one of the strangest things is if you research this tree, you find that this tree has a don't touch me appearance to it. It's a thorny tree. It is abundant in, in this desert area. It would have been very common in that area, but extremely thorny and has kind of a don't, don't come near me approach to it. So I thought not only does it express Christ's humanity, but it also expresses some form of uh, don't touch me. I thought that was interesting. And then God gives the dimensions. Um, here we go. So he says here two cubits and a half will be the length. So two, two and a half cubits is the length. Uh, interesting that this word cubits, by the way, comes from the Hebrew word, which is the root of the word mother. See so ya. two and a half mothers measurement. No, just joking. <laughs> that's, that's another church, I think. All right, so cubits. And let's not get hung up here. We'll, we can discuss what a cubit is. In fact, if you want to get really crazy, there are three different conversion rates to a cubit, and not all cubits are the same in the Bible, just so you know that. So if you're going to go and count and establish what this cubit means, the general measurement of the cubit, they would measure from the finger down to the forearm, leaning towards the elbow. But if you're measuring by barley corn, it's one measurement in inches, and if you're measuring by uh, another scholar's measurements, who's a famous scholar on the cubits of the Bible, it's another, they all approximate a, a mean average of somewhere between 17 and 18 inches for those who want to know. Not that you did, but there it is. All right, 
So two and a half cubits, this box, this Ark of the Covenant, two and a half cubits in length, a cubit and a half in breadth. Okay, so a cubit and a half in breadth. And it says here a cubit and a half in height, one and a half cubits in height. Now, why I said this was important is because we have two boards. We were going to make a, a box. Boy, this is going to be really pretty. All right. If we were making a box, or we'll put a square on top of a square. All right. Here we go. Oh, that's a better box. Wow. All right. Artistry at its finest. So the length, all right, two and a half. And we have, so we have two boards, two and a half and two and a half. And I would like to just say these underneath here will be wood, this acacia wood, and overlaid inside and out with pure gold. I'd like to just stop and think how much this typifies Christ in that we speak of Christ as man-God and God-man all at the same time. Without these boards, the form perhaps would not be as strong. He came and took up the form of a servant. We have these, all of these types woven in here. But putting that aside for a minute, let's look at the measurements. So two and a half, two and a half length, this board, and two and a half this length. We're not adding up all the dimensions, just the length on both sides. If you do two and a half twice is five, which is the number of grace in the Bible. And if we add up the height, we would have one and a half, and one and a half is three, or the breadth, the same thing. So threes and fives within these configurations are going to reappear. But why is this kind of very relevant? Because if you take the two numbers, three and five, you get eight, and eight is always the number of new beginnings. It's also the number of resurrection. And the contents of this box will also point to Christ in some resurrection dimension. So as we continue, it's necessary to just kind of point out some of these small details which I think are important. I'm making my way through this furniture, and, and I said, I'd like just to take the time. I don't want to rush, and then I know I'll be rushing at the last, so just bear with me. Thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, four rings put them at the four corners thereof. And that word in Hebrew corners is literally the four feet, even though it had no feet. So the four corners will have four rings so that they can put the staves, those bars uh, of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. So this whole thing is wood down here, this box, wood, and overlaid with gold and the, the staves, the posts, the poles to carry Beautiful drawing, I know. Uh, also gold. And thou shalt put the staves in to the rings of the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. They'll be carried, the, the ark will be carried that way. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and we read carefully, they shall not be taken from it. This whole picture of a pilgrimage, a journeying, the staves typifying, as we are today, we approach this subject with respect and reverence, much like in the framework people talk about Uzzah, the man who uh, went to stabilize the ark as he saw it as they were moving it, and it began to, to uh, shake like it was going to fall off the car. And he reached out to touch the ark, and God killed him. Now, I don't think he was reaching out in presumption. I think he was reaching out sincerely to uh, talk about doing a good thing the wrong way. Uh, wow. So this guy gets killed because he touched the ark when, in fact, the, the staves were the only carrying device. That's how you transported it. Obviously, the priesthood designated a certain set of people designated to carry this ark wherever they went, and you were not to touch it. Now, let me ask you, what, what point of that, don't touch it or you die, requires extreme obedience? Is that legalism or is that just smarts? God said, don't touch it. Okay, God, I get it. We won't touch it. All right, see, to me, obedience is not legalism in the Bible. It's just listening to God because somehow I think God knows what's best for me. He knows, uh, like mom saying, don't touch the oven, you kids. 
who want to touch the oven, you know what that means, all right? So, thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And Lord, help me to try and not go too far on this sidebar, but it's interesting to me when we did that word study on the testimony, and I tried to point out to you that the testimony here, referencing the words, the tablets of stone, of God, that the testimony, when it will progress into the New Testament as a concept, is always pointing back to the incarnate word now. It is not, testimony is not subjective and it is not personal. Now, testimony in a courtroom may be an eyewitness's account of something as they saw it. But the bulk of the usages as they are biblically understood for testimony begin with God telling his testimony is his word on the tablets of stone and will continue through the word as that, pointing to the word that then took up a tent of human flesh that became the living word and so forth. So it's not ambiguous and it's not subjective. Thank you. All right. Now, on top of this beautiful drawing I've made here, God says, Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half will be the length. So obviously, the length matches, thank goodness, otherwise it would be too big or too small. But the length will match perfectly with the length of the ark. And it says, a cubit and a half, the breadth thereof. So we have the same ability to cover, except now this will be beat up with gold. And we'll have, I'm not going to draw the cherubims. My, my cherubims will look freaky. So we'll just put these two beings here. They look nice. They look like aliens or something with, with wings. All right. OK. Wow. OK. You can say that you saw my art now. OK. So the measurements, as you can see, match up perfectly. And we could take the measurements again and say two and a half. And again, we'll come up with the same numbers, five and three. And of course, the height of which is not necessarily specified, but we can at least get some glimpse that the, uh, the appearance of what we have seen thus far uh, will be much in concert with the bottom part of the ark. And it says, The cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, cover the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall their faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon, above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony. God says it again. The words, the law, I'm going to give you. Now, this is being done so that God can what? Make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. And here it's being laid out even clearer that I will meet with thee and commune with thee from above the mercy seat. So we're now speaking of God saying, not only am I going to dwell among you, but a place where God and man can have communion reestablished again. And I'm telling you that all of this imagery is hugely important. We begin first. And I want to cover these one by one because I feel, as I said, it's a slum gullion. Now, we're not just going to talk about giving. We're looking at this box and its meaning. We know that in this box, in this ark, was placed three things. The pot of manna, that's one. Two, the second unbroken tablets of stone, and three, Aaron's rod that budded overnight. Now I want to look at these for a little bit of a, a lesson. We haven't navigated through these, and I want to look at these. Take a side road for a minute. Don't think that I have forgotten where I am. I have not. So we'll come back to giving in a minute. Right now I want you to go with me first to Exodus, um, Exodus 16. And I want to point this out, that the manna, we should not look at the manna any differently in, in conceptualizing ideas. God heard the cry of the people, 
miserable, murmuring bunch, ungrateful. And God makes this great miracle to feed them. We should not miss why he did it, but we should also not miss conceptualizing, is it a greater miracle that Christ, we, we have people who disbelieve and say, well, I can't believe that Christ fed four and 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes. Well, this is a much greater miracle. God rained down bread for the whole camp of hundreds of thousands of people. I always, I marvel at the way people look at the New Testament. They say, oh, I just have trouble believing that, that he, he could feed all those people. Well, God didn't have any trouble raining down the bread from heaven. So in Exodus 16, we read that the whole congregation, verse 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the flesh pots, where we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Hmm. Then the Lord said unto the Lord, then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them. We cover this word. That is to test to see with what intent. You remember that? We did that from the Greek pirasmos, which in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew done two, three hundred years B.C., we looked at this word pirasmos as in testing to see what is inside of you to pierce through, whether it's good or bad, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass on the sixth day they shall prepare, they'll bring it in, it shall be gathered. In other words, God's going to make provision. They'll gather this much every day, and in preparation for the Sabbath, they'll gather twice as much. No man is to take more or less. And the instructions are given to the people very, very plainly. It says, very, very simply put, that notwithstanding, in verse 20, they did not hearken unto Moses. Even though Moses gave them the commandment, take an omer daily, more or less every man will receive what he needs, and then for the Sabbath take twice as much, and they didn't listen to him. Tell me, is that any different than today, the greed that goes on within congregations in other places where people are so greedy? This is why I talked to you about the blessings and said, we'll get to that, but first get the mindset. God who has rained down this gift of manna daily for the people, they ate it while they were in the wilderness, God provided it, rained down this gift, tells them, Take, is, take this much. You collect each person daily for as many souls as in your household as needed, this prescribed amount for the Sabbath, twice as much. And if you take any more, it'll rot and become full of maggots. And they even saw that, but they didn't listen. Anyway, you can get the idea. They didn't listen to Moses regarding the prescribed amount it says, some left it until the morning they were to collect it, as they were told. And it bred worms, maggots, and it stank. Moses was very angry with them. You know, I have a feeling that the word wrath just doesn't cover the emotive perspective of Moses. But you get the idea here that once the people started to catch on to what Moses was saying, Read there in verse 24, they laid it up until morning as Moses bade, as he told them, and it did not stink, neither was there any worms. So as long as the people were doing what was prescribed and doing it God's way, they were okay. Now we jump from this mention to a lesson the same people are speaking in Numbers 11, if you'll turn there. In Numbers 11, remember, these people were dying of hunger. They were so hungry, and they said, why would you bring us out here to kill us with hunger? Now God's going to rain down manna and quail, and they get sweetened water. You know, wouldn't you like that? Everywhere you go, every whim, the minute you go, 
You just, you just go, and ding. All right. Hey, spoiled, spoiled people, right? Oh. Now, it, by the time we read in Numbers 11, listen to what the attitude of the people who were hungry. They were starving, remember? Now, Numbers 11:6 6 says, But now our soul is dried away. Literally, from the Hebrew, we have lost our appetite. We, ne we never see anything besides this manna. We hate this manna. God rained down a gift for them. This will show you why I said we have to tread really carefully when we speak about the things that we have already received, to tread really carefully. These are people that were hungry. They were starving. Now, we hate this manna. We loathe it. You get the idea, and then I'm going to make you go to one more place, which is Deuteronomy, the, the purpose. Deuteronomy 8 God is going to declare why manna and why it came down like this. It's right here before our eyes. Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Essentially, when we read the manna story, we read the human needs, that God was providing for the needs of the people. God was teaching a greater lesson, that man cannot live by bread alone. That depending, faithing on the Lord and His Word is the sustenance, is our life's flow. Lose that staff, not the bread, because the Lord will provide. Lose contact with the provider, and you've lost the life. So this, this pot of manna is extremely important. As I said, Three things are being declared, and we'll revisit this in a minute. I'd like to just say something as a, as a parenthesis. Interestingly enough, when Solomon built the temple, make a note of this, don't turn there now, but when Solomon built the temple in uh, Second Chronicles in chapter 5, just make a note, you can read it in your own leisure, it says that when they brought the ark in, Somehow, it says there was only the two tables of stone. There was no rod in there, and there was no pot of manna. And you're all going to say, well, I don't believe that. Yeah, it's, it's there. Read it for yourselves later. Uh, and somebody had to peer into that ark to see that there was only the law there and nothing else. It doesn't speak of any death. The only place where it speaks of death is in that place at Beth Shemesh where they moved the lid to look inside, and 50,000 people were killed instantaneously as they peered in. By the way, another type, which is if you lift away the covering, if you lift away where atonement is made for sins, where Christ, our propitiation and our propitiatory, if you lift this away and try to look in, on God's standards, the price is death because no one can keep the standard, the law, no one can keep it, the price is death. So 50,000 die Beth Shemesh because they looked in at God's holy standard, which for us as believers, without the covering of Christ, the mercy seat brings death. The law brings death. So we have all of these concepts that are lined up in here. Important because it shows God gave God gave the manna. God rained down the manna. He gave it. And we know that in type, this manna is Christ. We read in John's Gospel where Jesus says, Your fathers truly ate manna. The God rained down manna from heaven in the wilderness. But then he speaks of himself and says, But I am the true bread. He speaks of himself. Now, I want to point this out as just something to consider. 
that the reason why the pot of manna is not present in the ark at the presentation within the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 is because when you read in Revelation concerning the church, and I'll read it to you. Don't turn there. Too much, too much spinning. I want you to stay where you are. I'll read you the passage. But it's going to speak of um, to the church at Pergamos, which is in chapter 2. Don't turn there. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. I like that because the manna seemingly out of Second Chronicles is not in the ark anymore. And I'm telling you something just as a fact of history that God said before Solomon died, he said the kingdoms would divide at the death of Solomon. Knowing that the kingdoms would divide, there would be a divided kingdom. We would not have one, one king reigning, kingdoms divide. The people, as promised, as prophesied, would be carried away into captivity. The 70 years as spoken by the prophets. And then when worship is restored and the call to come back to rebuild out of Ezra and Nehemiah's books, we read that in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 8, they begin to read the law again, but there's no mention of manna and there's no mention of the rod. And I think there's good reason because it's all pointing to a future time. And I believe if you say, well, who, moved, who removed them? Well, I can tell you the ark in its constant uh, uh, moving around was taken, you know the story, I know you know the story, was taken by the Philistines. I love this, placed with their little peony god Dagon, and that god, when they placed the ark in that room, the gods on the floor, their god, the handmade god on the floor, missing arms all broken up, you know, they figure out this this ark is bad stuff here, you know. <laughs> Don't mess with God, right? They figure that out eventually, and it's like, how do, we, how do we get this thing, just move it away, just get it away from us? You know, really, if that's not enough to, to kind of turn somebody from their idols, you have to really, I, I look at this and I say, you know, that's proof enough they saw the power of God. Maybe they didn't recognize it as Yahweh, the living God, but they saw the power of God, and they said, how do we get rid of this thing? And still a little bit of indecisiveness. They said, if this, is, if this is of God, as we put this thing on the ark, it'll go on, on, an, on, a, on a bed carried by oxen. It'll go in one direction if it's God, their God. And if it's not, it'll go in another direction. It went off in the direction they said it would go if it was God. You'd think that'd be enough, you know, to say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm following that ark now. Well, they followed it a little while. And then they went back to Dagon. Something fishy going on here. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of great stuff when we speak of the pot of manna. And as I just said, I don't think it's an accident. I don't believe the Philistines, other than the incident recorded at, as I said, Beth Shemesh, I don't think the Philistines opened the lid. I don't think after they saw the Dagon incident even dared Somebody speculates, one of the scholars, that the Philistines took the rod and the pot of manna. I say that God, by the same power that brought Christ through a closed tomb, through that closed stone, took those elements out of the ark. Supernaturally, perhaps. Now, I'm telling you, this is my speculation, this part here. I tell you, everything else to date is fact. I tell you when I'm speculating, this is my opinion. And I tell you so, so you're not saying, well, Pastor Scott said da-da-da. I'm telling you, as in... Second Chronicles chapter 5, when it says there was nothing in there but the two tablets that were unbroken, the law. Now, what's interesting about this is every time we have kind of brushed by here really quick, we've said, yes, the law had to remain in the ark. The ark we know is Christ. The law had to remain in the ark as we understand, Christ came to fulfill the law. And having placed the law in here, knowing that this covering was needed, this covering being Christ, the place where the blood would be sprinkled, but 
had to be housed in here, in the ark. The law was placed in here. And we always speak of the law as a standard that no one could keep. We speak of the law in many different frameworks. But I'd like you to call attention to one thing, which never is brought up when we speak of the ark and the second tables of stone. That being that it was required for God to give a second pair of tables of stone because of the rebellion of the people and the golden calf incident where Moses is coming down from the mount. He says he hears the sound of noise of war, but no, it's people that are having a party. They built and made for themselves a golden calf. No one ever stops when we speak of this ark to say, perhaps this law would be a stark reminder for anyone who had come to the reality of the understanding of just who God is, that the second set was given in an act of grace. By the way, from the very beginning, when it first mentions the testimony, building the ark and the testimony, from the very beginning, I think it's Exodus 16, uh, 34, before there's even an ark, he says, in preparation for this, and this is where you will place the testimony, speaking of the law. Uh, 1634, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. That pot of manna. But the testimony had not yet been received. It sounds a little complicated, but it's not. My point being that if we were to look at the manna and the law right now, we could look at how these typify Christ, but we could also look at it as the failure of the people and the need for something greater than to occur because the people were not satisfied with this bread. Even though this bread rained down from heaven, they weren't satisfied with the bread. They could not keep the law. And what's the last thing? Placed in the ark, Aaron's rod that budded overnight. Now this, to me, is worth... You said, but are we doing giving? Yeah, I'll get there. I'm just a little slow today. You know, just bear with me. Uh, here's something interesting. We read of Aaron's rod in uh, number 16. I'm sorry, number 17. But I want to go back a little bit, and I'm going to just take my time. Because before we get to know about Aaron's rod, Aaron, of course, being the priest, the appointed priest, in number 16... We read of Korah's rebellion. And you can hardly think of Aaron's rod that budded overnight in that ark without looking back at how this came to be. Now, I know I'm going to take up some very precious time, but I'm going to do it because there's a message within a message, which I pray some are listening to this. It's, it's that important. Korah... Number 16, Kor, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel. So 250 of these well-known community leaders come up against Moses and against Aaron. And they basically say, I'm going to give you the colloquial version. You have gone too far, Moses. The whole community is holy. Why do you set yourself above the whole community as if you have special standing? You know, giving is never taught right, and neither is respect for God-ordained leadership. There's too many people. Dr. Gene Scott was right. Everybody is born an expert in religion and politics, but now I'm speaking of religion. Everybody's an expert on the Bible, but no one will take the time. They get mad. They find it highly offensive. Your behavior and the things you say, well, no different than these folks in the Bible. Where God appoints a leader, if it's God-appointed and God-ordained, you better move out of the way. You better get behind that person, and you better follow. Instead of, yeah... Well, well, how do I know that it's, it's God? 
Uh, this could be some cult where they just say they know something. That's why you have a Bible, silly. It's for you to go and check it out. That's your responsibility to check out your pastor, your teacher, whoever is guiding you, and to make sure they are bringing you the Word of God. Not twisted, not quasi with some modification here. I know it says this, but this is what we're going to do. And when you find the right person, don't look for perfection. Don't look at me to be perfect. I am a walking flesh pot that makes mistakes. But I'm telling you as a congregation, whatever I'm doing that I bring to you, if I step out of line, God will pull my chain. That's not for the saints. As the Apostle Paul said, God gave some gifts to the ministry for the perfecting of the saints and not the other way around. And the church will have spent so much time trying to figure out how they can get a ragdoll puppet on a string pastor or preacher to come and give the spiritual back massage while everybody's on a fast train to hell. I don't think so. Well, I just I don't like that. <laughs> well, read with me. Read how simple this is. This 250 of the well-known leaders in the community. Man, I could think of about 250 folk that used to be in this church who were well-known in the congregation, in the community congregation, who rose up against me. Who does she think she is? Now, let me just tell you something. You know, people say, well, yeah, but the Bible's a good story, and... God doesn't do these things anymore. No, he does worse. <laughs> because having been enlightened, there's a lot of admonition. Having been enlightened, you cannot step back and say, now I refuse to deal with the truth. This is, I have a few of these in the congregation today sitting here. They know what I'm saying is true. You've come with baggage. You've come with tradition. And it's just too scary for you to say two feet standing on the rock Jesus Christ and on his word. And I'll risk whatever piddling thing I think I'm risking by staying firm on the anchor of my soul, Jesus, than to stay in the safety zone of a spiritual back rub, which may feel good, but ain't going to get you any closer to heaven. It ain't going to conform you to the image and likeness of Christ. It'll help you in the now for a little while. Now, these all rose up against Moses and Aaron. Moses heard... What was going on? He fell upon his face, spake unto Korah and all his company, saying, Okay, we're going to see what's going to happen here in the morning. The Lord will show who are his and who's holy, and uh, will cause him to come near unto him. So basically the person, the one that he's chosen, he'll cause to come near unto him. Korah, you do this thing. Take your censers and all your company, all your gang, your 250 of you, put fire in it, incense, in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose shall be holy. And then if you read in the Hebrew, Moses says, you Levites have gone too far. While they came to him and said, Moses, you've, you've gone too far. You've carried this leadership thing too far. They came against him. And Moses said unto Korah, here I pray you, sons of Levi, you know, it seemeth but a small thing unto you, isn't it enough that uh, the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation to bring you near to him, to do the service in the tabernacle, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? Isn't that enough? But now you also seek the priesthood? You want Moses' vocation? Believe me, there's a lot of folks that, that's why I said to you, this is, I, I, I'm telling you, 200 well-known community leaders used to be in this church. When I say community, well-known folk. And you want the priesthood too? You want my responsibilities? Are you nuts? You want the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron? Who is he that you're murmuring against him? Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram. These are another group. And they said, no, we're not coming, Moses. It's a small thing that you brought us up out of the land that flows with milk and honey. They're talking about Egypt. You're going the wrong way. Now, listen, if this doesn't sound like Christianity today where people are talking about, take me back to Egypt. You ever met anybody that says, 
you know what? I need to go out and live my life. I can't, I can't be in the church. I could go find myself out there. You met people like that? They want to go back to Egypt. The fact of the matter is when you are in Christ, you discover more about who you are, the person God designed you to be, the real person in God, than going to explore yourself out in the world where Satan's very crafty. There's something out there for you. Go find it. Anything to get you out of the church and out of God's way. He brought us out of the land that flows with milk and honey, Egypt, to kill us in the wilderness. Except you'd make yourself a prince over... Now, you're going to lord it over us. You brought us here. Now what? Moreover, I'm not finished complaining. <laughs> you brought us into a land that doesn't have any milk or honey. You said you were going to give us an inheritance, fields and vineyards. I don't see nothing. You want to gouge your eyes out also? And Moses was very wroth. He said unto the Lord, respect not their offering. That's, I want to point that out to you. Don't take their offering. Why? Because I had a bad attitude. Somebody said to me, why do you send back people's offerings if they've uh, stepped out of line with the pastor? That's, that's kind of crazy. You just take the money. Well, by biblical principles, I'm reading the Bible. Moses said, don't take their offering. If you're out of fellowship with the pastor and you're out of fellowship in the congregation, don't think that sending your tithe in somehow is going to appease or you're going to, by an evil spirit, get it in somehow just to say you did it now. Here, now, <laughs> it's still an evil spirit. See, there's a lot of teaching I'm doing between the lines that you don't even know that I'm doing, so it doesn't matter. I'm doing it. All right. <laughs> because there's a lot of new folks. They don't have 20 and 30 years such as some of you do. And they don't understand, why do you do that? I've told you the story. I pray maybe this woman's listening. I told you the story. It was at our worst time. This was just in the first year after Dr. Scott's promotion. Not even a year had passed. I'm following his instructions as to the charge he's given me to have service on Sunday as he instructed me to do. And some woman who used to send in rather large offerings thought she would complain about me taking up that one hour on Sunday. Why are you taking up one hour of airtime? We should see Dr. Scott in that hour. And I sent in an offering. Here's my pledge. And I call you and say, send that money back. I'd rather burn in hell than take that money from somebody who has a bad heart, who doesn't give up. <laughs> who doesn't, wait a minute, wait a minute who doesn't give a care about the instructions coming from Dr. Scott to Pastor Scott, just I want what I want because I want it. And is that not the root of sin? All we like sheep? I said, send that money. We needed the money. I mean, we, really, we were in dire straits in that first year. I said, send the money back. God will work it out for me. I will not take that money. And if that person sends money, send it back. I don't want it. Well, couldn't you be more nice about it? No. I'm running this ship. There can be only one captain, one person giving the charge. You either get in the boat and say, yes, ma'am, I'm doing it, or get out, because if you, go, if you, if you won't, if, if you won't, listen to me. Listen to me. Sis. No, 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 stop. Listen to me. More than one person steering the ship, the ship goes down. There's one captain, there's one driver. You can't drive a car with two steering wheels. I'm sorry, it will not work. Unless you want to ride a bicycle where the person up front is doing the steering, I suggest you become a passenger. So, having said all this, I get, you know, I get very animated. People don't understand I'm beginning to understand in my 40s. It's taken me a long time to understand. My ways were all wrong. I had world ways and world ideas, but God's ways that are radically different than our ways, he spells it out in no uncertain terms. It's not ambiguous. There's nothing that we have to think about here. Moses is talking, he says, respect not their offering. For I have not taken one ass from them, no, not an animal. I have not hurt them. I have not done anything to them. Moses said unto Korah, 
Be thou all in that company before the Lord, and they and Aaron tomorrow. Every man take his censers, put incense in them, bring them before the Lord. 250 censers. Now, I can tell you, to speed this all up, you know the end of the story. I love this. For Korah's rebellion, Moses says, Korah and his household, he says, if these die a natural death, such as men normally die as they do die naturally, then it's not God. But if they die of some, something that's not natural, and the minute that Moses was done talking, the earth opens up and swallows up Korah and his family, and whoo, down right there in the pit. Now, I think, you know, if I was an onlooker in the camp, I'd say, Moses, can I be your friend? <laughs> you know, just something not to mess with, but... We have 250, 250 men, apart from Korah. Now remember, there was two rebellions in one simultaneous event. Korah is against the priesthood, and we have a, a, the two other, uh, Dathan and Abiram, taking their cause against Moses. So literally now, the whole organization, the leader and the priest, the deliverer and the priest, are coming under attack. Now the other thing that happens as you know is 250 of these men show up with their censers and they are they are literally singed into dust cold remains. Yes. And uh, by the way, just so you know, I like what happens uh, after these 250 men are singed up and I say, yep. Now we know that uh, we were right and they were wrong. So after that, I'm reading from number 16. After that, uh, we're told that the, the censors were to be taken from out of the remains and beaten down to become a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord. So this would be hammered on to the altar, the brazen altar, as a memorial, as a reminder as they came to offer offerings to that brazen altar, they would see this hammered plaque as, and no, it didn't say in loving memory of. <laughs> it was a stark reminder that each time one approached to make an offering, they would see to rebel against that which God has ordained and established meant death. Now, I had to do all this background to come to the point where we understand if it wasn't enough that we have 250 people that are wiped out and Korah and his band, the next day all the congregation of Israel came and murmured against Moses and Aaron and said, you've killed the people of the Lord. You've killed the people of the Lord. It's your fault. It's like a bad marriage, right? And they looked Toward the tabernacle of the congregation, behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And God's going to wipe out this band. He's, he's got enough. He put the plague on them. Now, people don't like to hear this, but if you read through the Pentateuch, you're going to find God put a lot of plagues on the children in the wilderness. And I love this. You know, you'd think that Aaron and Moses would have just said, okay, guys, now you got the plague. See ya. We're picking up and moving on. Right? Moses said unto Aaron, take a censer, put fire in the, uh, from off the altar, put the incense, go quickly unto the congregation, make an atonement, make an offering for them. For there was wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. Aaron took as Moses commanded. No, no, wait a minute. Aaron decided, wait a minute, Moses doesn't know what he's saying. I'm going to do something else. That's why I said obedience is important. To, to kill the point, obedience is important. He did what Moses said and says, he stood, Aaron stood between the dead and the living as he made that atonement for the people and the plague was stayed. Now God wiped out 14,700 people from that plague alone. You think about that. And this was because they, God finally had enough. 
Now, if this is not enough, number 17, lest you think that I've forgotten why I'm here, number 17, we're going to talk about Aaron's rod that budded. And I love this. To now make sure that Aaron is the one, from each tribe, you all bring a rod representing your tribe. And each one did according to what was told to them. They laid up the rods, that's uh, number 17, 7, they laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. Every man's name was written upon his rod, and as you know, the rod is the emblem of rule and authority. The picture of rule and authority, which is sourced in God. So, it came to pass on the morrow when Moses went in the tabernacle of witness, behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi. I want you to note three things was budded and brought forth buds, bloomed, blossoms, and yielded almonds. Three things from this rod. And by the way, it's Aaron that was chosen as the one because his became the living rod amongst all of those dead from every tribe. His was the living rod. But three things I would ask you to note, that it budded, bloomed, and yielded fruit. So when we speak of the type of resurrection as something that was, as Christ was, a root out of dry ground, that it budded. You read in Isaiah how it describes the shoot that came forth, and the Hebrew gives the impression of a bud, but through his ministry, including being somewhere under here, the firstborn or the first fruit. So we have in the rod that budded a threefold concept not just typifying resurrection, but the fruit of resurrected life, right and authority given from God. So these three elements, and I've, I've gone all this way to take you around to show you the contents of what was placed in this ark. Now, with these three items being placed in and the history of what I've just told you behind them, the mercy seat is placed on top. This covering now, this mercy seat, is not to be lifted away. It is to be placed on here and to remain. And God says, this is where I will meet and com commune with you. This is where you will sprinkle the blood. It is this area here between the cherubims. God says, his glory. So when we think about the contents of the ark and the ark itself being Christ and the measurements of the ark representing resurrection, and we also have to say, by the way, that God gave the gift of the manna. God gave the gift in grace, by the way, of that second set of tables. Even though they weren't representing grace, it was graceful of God to give a second set. And the grace of God infusing life, giving life into something that by itself did not have life. So all of these represent God's gifts placed in this box and covered. Now that I've established that, Let's go back and see what else, other instructions. We're still building here. Exodus 25 and 23. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof. Two cubits. Two cubits shall be the length thereof. Well, we see here the length of the ark was two and a half. So the length of the table, two cubits, we'd have two, to make a table, we'd have two boards, if you will. And by the way, I just want to make a footnote. There was no wood in this top covering. This is pure gold, and the bottom portion does contain wood. So this here signifying the humanity and deity of Christ. This here is purely 100% the deity, everything, including the sacrifice made here, pointing to Christ, all divine, not human, not of humankind. Back to the table. So two cubits here, two cubits, and we'll say two, two times two. We have the number four in the table of showbread and a cubit. The cubit, a cubit for the breath, one cubit this way, and a cubit and a half 
the height, one cubit and a half for the height. So this table has the same height as the arc. It is on the same plane. If we were going to put things in perspective, it is on the same visual plane as what is typifying Christ and the sacrifice. And we have clearly said that four typifying the whole earth as a number, all of creation, the whole earth. We've got some different numbers here. Four and one and one is two. Adequate witness. We could go on and go off on numbers. I just want to make the point that the measurements are distinctly different except for the height measurement of the table of showbread. And we've already pointed out that the, the bread on this table was made from the ground up manna. We read that in a different passage in Leviticus, I believe 24, it speaks of how they were to prepare, grind up with fine flour. The instructions are given for this bread to be placed on the table of showbread. In fact, I want to read that. I don't care that I'm running out of time. All right, I hope you don't care either. If you do, too bad. All right. <laughs> Leviticus 24, this is important. Leviticus 24 and verse 5. <clears throat> Thou shalt take fine flour, bake 12 cakes thereof, two tenths deal shall be in one cake. You'll set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. Thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So it becomes clear, this is an offering from the people to God. We said last week, this cannot be a type of Christ because Christ was never an offering from people to God. God gave his only begotten son. So it's not typifying, the bread on the table is not typifying Christ, but is typifying giving. Our giving presented before the Lord. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by perpetual statute. Most holy of the offerings. Well, is there something else we can do in place? Can we have a substitution? He just said this is the most holy. And if you'll indulge me, one other passage where it speaks of in Leviticus 8 and 31, when they've offered offerings. And it says, I like the pages turning. That sounds good. Moses said unto Aaron, Leviticus 8, verse 31, Moses said unto Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and there eat it with the bread that is in the basket of consecrations, as I have commanded, saying, Aaron and his son shall eat. Now, here they would eat the bread and the remnant that remained of flesh and bread they burned with fire. But the bread which is being spoken of, which I've just described, was for the priesthood. When they could eat as much bread, this is what's wrong with the church. People are not willing to understand in the day where this order was made, no one supervised how much bread Aaron and his sons were eating. Like, did they have a weigh-in, like the biggest loser, where they'd step on the scale and come up and, wow, you gained three pounds this week. You must be eating a lot of bread. Well, you ought to not have that much bread, Aaron. You know, you should uh, live a little less. You know, live a little bit more modestly because that's, that's the way the priesthood should be. No, 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 no. If you read this, you'll find that the priesthood had no inheritance in the land. Therefore, God said he would make provision for them out of the things that were brought to the tabernacle. This is the missing message. Every preacher has to make excuses for why they should have substance, and I'm not speaking about being ostentatious. If that's, your, if that's your deal, good for you. It's not mine. But there shouldn't be an excuse making as to why a preacher or teacher of God's word, someone who is typifying Aaron's work, Christ is our ultimate priest, but on earth as an under-shepherd, no one should have to make excuses as to why we have. The priesthood gives this pattern. 
And believe me, the priesthood also gives examples of abuse that we can learn very plainly from. That's not my subject today, but I can tell you what is. They're going to move this tabernacle now. I'm only talking about two things today because I'm, I've already gone way over my time. We're talking about the ark, what's in the ark that typifies the work of Christ, the lid, the mercy seat where blood was sprinkled on the great day of atonement where Christ, Romans 3.25, says, whom God sent to be a propitiation for us. Speaking of Christ, speaking of this becoming a reality, Christ, our propitiatory, our propitiation and propitiatory, both. And this bread placed on this table. So now they're going to pick up the camp. And as the camp would move, procedures, each priesthood had a set specific task to do in the moving of the ark, in the moving of the table. And I can tell you one thing. Why these are crucially important? Because underneath here we see Speaking of the resurrection, we too shall rise, now the offering. We have here a type of a pattern that will become what I've just pointed to in 1 Corinthians 15, a type of Christ that will become and is yet for us, a type and pattern for us in the life we're living as Christians to be fulfilled. And now concerning the collection, here's the table of showbread. And this table, as an offering from the people to God, as it is moved, different from the ark and different from the candlestick and different from the altar, the golden altar, to be moved, covering up the ark as they moved it. I always read this in the, I don't know why I read this invertedly. For years I read this invertedly. I thought when they moved the ark, that the ark, this ark of the covenant with the mercy seat, it's actually going to have a badger skin covering first, and then be covered in blue. Read it carefully. You'll see some of us have been reading in reverse. It's going to have, this ark is going to have badger skin and then a covering of blue. The badger skin, it has been said, represents the most uh, or least attractive animal in the desert. But I will tell you, it was also used in Ezekiel's prophecy for shoes. Shoes were made for fancy women with this badger skin. Same word. So I would just put a little footnote and say it may, it may have no good appearance to it as a covering, but it was always assumed as something used that was durable for traveling. The shoes in Ezekiel kind of put the twist together. It had no beauty appearance to it, unattractive, covered up, and then a covering of blue. Read it carefully, you'll find out that's how the ark was transported. I'm not talking about the tent, I'm speaking of the ark of the covenant. But the table... It's covered with a covering first of blue, representing God's, God's eternal nature. And then after that, we have a covering of scarlet, representing kingly, priestly, kingly and priestly, and a covering over that of badger skin. So as these tools, as these uh, contents of the tabernacle travel, including, as I said, the candelabra, as it goes, has a covering on it as well. Everything is covered. But the one thing that I find remarkable is that the ark, which we would run to immediately, we would avoid this table of showbread and run to the ark, it's got a covering of blue. We're attracted to it. We see it and we say, oh, that's the divine piece of furniture being moved. But this table with its covering, which has badger skin, which is kind of ugly in appearance, we would be repulsed from this table, which represents giving. And as they traveled, you could not escape this picture of all of these instruments being moved and covered with these coverings. Badger skin, repulsive, blue, of course, for anybody looking on the outside would see this beautiful blue and be attracted as we are. Oh, the, the beautiful deity of God, the blue, the eternal blue. We love this ark. We love it. It contains all these wonderful things. It contains the law. It contains the manna. It contains Aaron's rod. rod. We, can, we can have a, an offering offered right here on the great day of atonement. We love this blue covering. But over here we come to this table and we see in transit badger skin. Ooh, get me away from that. That's not attractive at all. And that is how the church treats money and offerings. That table represents offerings. You cannot escape it. As long as this 
tabernacle was moved from place to place. And even when Solomon builds the temple and says he will, he will have a permanent place for God's glory to abide, this will be put there and the ordinances will be maintained. Giving is at the center of it all. In fact, if you would take the time to read in Solomon's record, after he brings the ark in and they install it, they offered offerings that says too numerous to count. So let me ask you a question. Why is it that we're so attracted and drawn to this beautiful picture of the resurrection? It does something for me, right? It's for me. It does something for me. Christ is risen and is the first goer, and we too shall rise. It does something for me. I'm attracted to this. It offers something to please me in my nature. But this, God said, will be a perpetual offering. Please God enough to say this do perpetually. And yet, we'll run to this first. In fact, we'll run to this. We'll run to the candlestick. We'll run to anything else but having to deal with this table, which represents side by side with this ark, which is Christ, our giving. The church... People sitting in the pews saying, oh, that's terrible. That's absolutely terrible. I would have preferred it if you would have taught me about the mercy seat. Teach me about the altar of incense where prayer is offered up. Teach me about that lampstand where we talk about the glorious flowing of the Spirit and those, all of the symbolism and numerology that's in that candlestick. Tell me about those things, but don't tell me about this badger skin table that I have to do something with. Well, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you what in picture and type is unfolded for us. We like to revel in this pot of manna, and we say that manna, Christ. We like to revel in the fact that the law, unbroken, Christ, it says the law, the curse fell on him, and we passed out from underneath it. And Aaron's rod that budded, he is risen. We too shall rise. So let me ask you something. Why is it when we come to this table, and it's so simple to me, God's eternal nature, touching this instrument, his blue cloth, touching this instrument. Why is it so difficult for us to see in these symbols God's care to put in there, giving as an integral part? Don't just tell me that you're going to offer something here, which eventually becomes one offering for all mankind, and not talk to me about what pleases God. This is the crime of the century. Should we invent something? And yet, if you go back to the beginning when Moses came down and talked to the people, later on, it's in Exodus 35 through 37, some, somewhere around there, he comes down and gives the instructions to the people, and they are participating. Now tell me, why do we have to come up with techniques to teach people and motivate people when right at the center of these instruments inside the tent which then is, becomes the permanent abode in the temple. Why do we have to come up with something other than this offering, which God said most holy, obviously set aside. Believe me, God, if he wanted to make bread, he could make bread like this, ding, and there's bread. Jesus did it when he fed the multitudes. This is why I said, why is it such a thing for us to look at that miracle and say, well, that's kind of impossible. But this particular miracle of raining manna down, the people collecting it, taking that manna, grinding it up, baking bread, and bringing it back to God as an offering should be seen as disdainful. That's why I'm telling you as a congregation, I'm telling you as listeners out there, don't try and take giving out of the church. Don't try and take giving out of the congregation. Don't try and take giving out of this book. Page by page, look for yourselves, you will find offerings and offerings and offerings. Oh, well, what about into the New Testament? We've already been there. We know the blood of bulls and goats no longer offered anymore. That's done away with. One offering Christ. That sacrifice made once and for all. What about giving? Paul writer of two-thirds of the New Testament didn't have a problem with now concerning the collection. As I have given order and charge to the churches of Galatia, so I also give you. Well, I liked it good until you said now concerning the collection. Well, let me just tell you something. You prove the genuineness of God's Spirit in you. We all want to talk about spirituality, but you prove the genuineness of God's Spirit in you 
by the way you give, of yourself and of the things that you claim to possess. Now, the scripture clearly declares if you don't have the Spirit of God, of Christ, you're none of His. And what does this Spirit look like when it comes into you? It looks like Christ, and Christ was a giver. Now, if people don't like that message woven into the tapestry of this is to teach us the possessions we cling to and hold on to so dearly, the tighter you hold on, I'll tell you one thing, God has a great way of, if He wants to teach you the lesson of giving, He will pry your fingers off. He will pry your fingers off eventually, until finally when your fingers are pried off, you'll, you'll find a new thing to latch on to. And it'll be another thing, until you get the idea that these are all in the temporal, they are all in the temporary, and God says, I have a better thing laid up for you. Let go. And listen to my word. Now, if God's not ashamed to declare that giving is at the center message of Christianity through and through, why should pastors be ashamed to teach on that subject? Now, like Paul, the glorious truth being presented of the resurrected Christ, of whom he was a witness, telling those at Corinth, at, simply put, we too shall rise, as he is risen as the first goer, now... Concerning the collection, I say to you as the church, without embarrassment, without shame, it should be the greatest thing we do, week in and week out. There are very few things that God lets us participate in, but these things that he lets us do should be done with a joyful and willing heart. Now, concerning the collection, it's offering time. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.